Hello everyone, in today's video I thought we'd take a couple minutes to show you how to file a flight plan in VATSIM. Now we've done a bunch of VATSIM in the past, I've made little mentions to this, but now sometimes you probably popped on here, looked down this thing and went, oh my god, what have I done? The good news is uh, you really only need to fill out stuff on the top, and in a lot of cases I've actually filed flight plans directly inside of the actual flight simulator itself. As a matter of fact, you can take this a step further. If you were to actually open up vPilot directly and click on the flight plan button, notice there's virtually nothing here as far as uh, details goes. Now that works to our favor, that doesn't work to our favor in a couple different cases, and I'll go ahead and show you what I mean by that real fast. So to get here, basically what you're going to do is pop onto Google, you're going to type in my VATSIM, it's going to give you the ability to go ahead and sign in with whatever your CID is, it's going to take you to this page, and um, of course most of you folks have probably seen this before, I'll be going through the kind of categories that are critical and kind of how to do it quickly, I guess is what I want to say here. So first of all, uh, we're going to take a look at the top option here, this is our call sign, now keep in mind when we do call signs, my standard call sign is a red 64 here, which is interesting because it's actually, if it was a tail number, it would be red 64, if it is a flight number, it is red 64, because technically you're supposed to group digits together. So if you want to be something really, really whatever, you want to make sure that you pronounce that precisely. Uh, for those people who are a little silly, uh, blue 420 or something like that would not be 420, it would be uh, blue 420. It's just kind of fun. So anyway, you're going to go ahead and type in your call sign there. Keep in mind, this call sign has to be the same thing as the thing you enter into VATSIM when you sign into vPilot, otherwise it's not going to work. Next item is going to be flight rules. The rule here is pretty straightforward. Uh, IFR, um, for those who are familiar with it, that's instrument flight rules. Air traffic control is basically going to run the show the entire time. You're going to be flying between navigational aids. You have strict altitude restrictions. You know, if you file for 3,000, if you have 4,000, you're going to get chewed out. Don't do that, especially in the real world. Uh, you get worse than chewed out. VFR basically says if the visual conditions are good enough that you can fly by looking at ground reference alone, go nuts. Now, when I fly aircraft, I find myself spending most of the time in VFR. I only do IFR if I have a particular reason, or I'm doing something like flying an airliner and I have to go above 18,000 feet. Next type is aircraft type. This is the ICAO code for aircraft type. So what I like to do, ICAO aircraft codes. So what I like to do is one of these searches. You go ahead and pop up this one. This is a great website. This is the actual iCal themselves. And you can actually search for the different type designators. So, you know, I could type in Cessna, for example, and it'll give you all the different codes. Now, these are the codes you need to enter there. For example, if I was flying a Cessna 172, I just grab Cessna 172, come up in here, and do Cessna 172, just like that. If I were flying the RG version, it would be Cessna 72R, Cessna 72R. Notice that massive amounts of the Cessna are clumped into one group. Now, a lot of people get a little confused about that because now they're like, wait, wait, aren't there different versions of the Cessna with different speeds? The answer is, yeah, but that doesn't matter that much. The other thing we're going to get on side of this page, which we really, really need to know, is this little thing over here that says WTC. This is our weight category. We need to know this, and you'll see why in a minute. So popping back over here, we have our Cessna. We're flying on a Cessna 172 here, so just C172. Weight category. This is based on your takeoff weight. That's the m tau maximum takeoff weight, not current takeoff weight. So if you have something like uh, B-52, you might find yourself kind of between categories. If your aircraft is less than 7,000 kilograms, which 172 is, boop, pop that one. If you're less than 136,000 kilograms, which puts you pretty much in regional airliner territory, probably going to pick this one. Heavy, you're going to be have things like 747s, uh, 777s, stuff like that. And super, there's only one super weight category, and that is the Airbus A380. If you've ever seen one of those, you'll realize, oh, well, that's why it's so big. Next item on the list, we have what they call the equipment. And now they say ICAO slash FAA. I find this a little annoying and misleading because a lot of people get a little confused with this category. So aircraft type, we type in ICAO, aircraft, equipment. Don't panic. It's going to look scary. It's not as bad as it looks. We're going to go ahead and pop this one open real quick. And we're going to do the search. Do, do, do. It's going to pop up. And it's going to give you this massive list of equipment codes. So what this is, this is your combination communications, combination navigation equipment. A lot of people see this category and freak out. I can say in the real world, if you have a G1000, you're probably going to freak out a little bit because like, what codes do I need? Ah, don't panic. Everything is here. Now, one nice thing about this particular website, this is the UASC, for those who are looking at it, is it'll actually list out what the different codes mean. As a general rule, when you're working with codes, you're only going to be using codes that actually match the aircraft you want. Now, this is kind of nice because this gives you all what they call, basically, I call them the airliner codes for RMP and RMP and stuff like that. If you are dealing with codes like this, you are probably in a situation where you're flying some kind of airliner, but these are not the codes we want. However, if we pop on our good friend uh, equipment over codes here on Wikipedia, you can see all the codes here. So here's how it works. You simply take the letter to represent what piece of technology you have. For example, if I have a DME and I have Loran, my code would be CD. If I have a GPS, which is also known as GNSS, 
and I have, uh, let's see, an ILS approach, I'd be GL. Now, you're probably saying, you might end up with a lot of letters. Uh, you're not wrong. Now, if I'm flying the 172 here, this one has a standard equipment. Standard? What's that? Standard simply means you have VHF, RTF, VOR, and ILS. This simply means you have the good old-fashioned regular sets of equipments. So most of the time, I find that I have standard, which is, again, VHF radio, combined with GPS. So what I would write down here is I'd write S for standard equipment, G simply saying that I have myself GPS. Now, you probably saw that giant piece of things here. So this would mean I have standard, I have ADF. Let's see what the B code was here. I have LPV, which is a little excessive, I think. I have D, which would represent DMA. I have a G, which would stand for your GNSS. And then I have R, which would mean PBN approved. Now, you're probably sitting here going, whoa, man, you've already blown me away. What is PBN all about? Well, big airliners have very complicated navigation systems made up of multiple pieces all connected to one to make it possible to work. So the way that they get around some of the stuff is rather than saying I got a GPS, is they have all sorts of fancy systems for it. And that was that page we were looking a few minutes ago. So it's always worth kind of checking this out. So if you're not sure what to put in this category, boop, boop. That will get you out of 90% of your problems because it simply means you have the standard equipment and it also means you have GPS. In the real world, this gets a little more complicated, but for the good folks at VATSIM, they need to know what your equipment is on board if they're going to be able to tell you what kind of routing. Like uh, one of the things I've had a problem with is I'll be flying something like a DC-6 that doesn't have a GPS. It might not even have an S. And all of a sudden you run into a problem where they call you and give you an approach. You can't fly or they say something like proceed direct, whatever, you know, boy point five. And you're like, um, I can't do that. I don't have a GPS. <laughs> so it's very interesting. Next code is transponder code. Interestingly enough, this is something from the real world that is more important than it is in VATSIM. Notice there's a little star, meaning it's not required. Uh, this would simply mean, uh, what's your transponder code? Okay, let's see. Right here. So we have different flavors of transponders. Uh, and there's a general rule in VATSIM. Just put yourself on L because technically everything is an L in VATSIM, even though it might not have those capabilities. Departure point is pretty straightforward. This is where we're going to be taken off from. I like to go pop over to Sky Vector for this. Let's go ahead and create ourselves a quick flight plan. Whoa, look at the weather. Let's go from here, and then we'll uh, scroll down until we go to Atlanta. Why not? Uh, that flight, whew, that's a little far. Let's do a little bit closer. Okay, CLT. There we go. 279 miles. Yeah, I'm going to fly that on 172. So what I like to do on Sky Vectors, I like to pop up my speed real quickly. I'll type in something like uh, I get 120, I think is what I'm going to get. And the game I always play, too, is I'm messing with the altitude. We're going to be traveling IFR because of the weather. Let's try O2. O2 is two out. Oh, sorry. We'll try, uh, let's see, 040, that's going to be 3 hours and 25. 060, it's going to be 337, going up. So we have to do absolute minimum altitude here, 020. Three hours and three minutes, if I can somehow stay that low, which I'm pretty confident you're not going to be able to fly that low. So we'll call it 4,000. 4,000, three hours, 25 minutes. Delightful. So then we go back over here. We go ahead and type in where we're taking off. We're taking off from Washington. Uh, off block time. Oh, no, what time are we taking off? <laughs> at the top of the screen is going to give you the UTC time. So with the UTC time, what I always do is I take a look at that and say, well, if I'm taking off in 10 minutes, I just add 10 minutes to this. Now, if you need something like IFR clearance, I usually tell people to follow about um, 20, 30 minutes beforehand so that the good people in air traffic control land can figure out when they're going to get you in the air. So right now, like, for example, if I wanted to take off in 10 minutes, I'd say 1435 here. 1435, no problem. Altitude, uh, we said super duper low. We're going to say 4,000 feet. Now, notice it says altitude in feet. There's nothing about flight levels here, so you got to be mindful. Airspeed, uh, we can get that right off there. And the interesting thing is, you know, notice all those N's and K's. We don't have to enter that like we do in the real world. Arrival, uh, we're going into Charlotte. And then alternate. Alternate airports, notice is not required. If you are going to file for an alternate, uh, generally, if you ever have a situation where you know that the weather is going to be marginal at the destination, technically, if you know you're running into like less than a mile of visibility at your place, you probably want to plan for some kind of alternate. In this case, I'm looking for an alternate that's got some VFR here. Uh, Penny Island looks pretty good. We'll go KEWN. Obviously, I plan for the alternate in case things don't go well. Time on route, we're just going to steal this number directly. Uh, the time on route here is going to be 3 hours and 25. So what you do is you go 0325, just like that. And that's going to give you 3 hours and 25 minutes. Fuel endurance, uh, how much fuel we carry on this thing? Well, if you go over to the 172 inside of the flight sim, weight and balance, none of this helps you. What you do know, however, is that fuel, 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 yeah, fuel, 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 got it. Uh, we know we burn at about 9 gallons per hour. So we can do 28 times 2 divided by 9 gets us about 6 hours, 0.2. But remember, we have to climb. So I always call that, let's call it 5 hours and 35 minutes. Or 5 hours and 30 is fine. Keep in mind, if you're an airliner, this number is going to look very different than it is if we're like this. Then we come to route details. Now, the interesting thing is in VATSIM, if you're proceeding direct, 
you can just write DCT, and that's not going to be some funky waypoint in the middle of nowhere. That actually just means you're going there like it's a straight line. Now, if we were flying this one IFR, that gets a little more complicated. What we'd actually have to do is we'd have to go pop onto world high. I'm sorry, world low, because we're 172 here. And we basically have to navigate our way down there. You know, I've covered how to do this in the past, but we'll just do it real fast, because it only takes a few minutes. I will do Gordonsville. Let's see here. How can we get down from Gordonsville? Looks good right there. I'm going to go ahead and connect this one. Of course, I'm not checking smart things like, uh, you know, are we accidentally going a wrong direction on a one-way road here? But it's okay. Like I said, this is just a quick demonstration. And we'll go ahead and use this one right here. And we'll say that's our last waypoint. Was that Gizmo? Take a look. It is Gizmo. What a neat name for a waypoint. Oh, yep. See how that's one way? So you couldn't actually file this because, unfortunately, you go smacking right into it. Go ahead and copy. Zip over here. Control A, Control V. And look at that. So now we've gone ahead and put in our flight plan. Now it's worth noting on that sim, you've got to make sure that you do preferred routing. So what I like to do is I like to go preferred routing, or you can do preferred routes. And it's gonna take you to this website that looks like this. This allows you to dial in where you're coming from and where you're going. And what it will do is it'll go ahead and tell you if there's already an existing route for it. So if I search, I notice there's a one that goes from Washington to Charlotte and it gives you a preferred route that looks like this. Now, the cool thing is I can control C this one. I can go over to Sky Vector and control A, control V. Boop, push the button and look at that. Actually, their route was very, very similar to mine. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Unfortunately, it picked up one of the waypoints somewhere else on planet Earth. So if I zoom out here, it probably has some extremely, extremely far away waypoint that uh, we can't solve right now, but that's okay. We could always take this one and paste this one like this, but I've got to warn you now, double check this flight to make sure that it works in the flight simulator that you're operating in. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you can't fly it, or they're going to call you from VATSIM and they're going to be like, can you take this routing instead? And it's going to be different. So be very mindful. And remember, this routing can be direct if you're under VFR rules. All right, now we get to what I call the optional stuff. The optional stuff is going to be the kinds of things that um, are going to be things you can put into the flight plan, but they're not insanely critical here. Uh, one thing that I do always like to make sure is make sure your data flight is correct and double check to make sure your so rules for your voice is correct. You can voice, receive voice, text only. Text only is if you're first starting out for VATSIM, it's not bad. I like receive voice personally because that forces you to have to listen to them and then type back the responses when you're ready for full voice. So you can go ahead and bop that button. So now what about all of these? Now this is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. And I usually warn people that there's a reason why there's not a star next to these. All these codes are basically part of the iCal flight plan that gives you all sorts of different sort of pieces here as far as uh, what you can do, what you can't do, what kind of navigation equipment you have, everything under the sun. Now the reason that I usually tell people to kind of avoid these is because it's kind of get a little messy before you uh, try to actually fill them out directly. So our first one up here, uh, you got your PBN. That's simply going to refer to what type of approach you can do. Now, there's a wide variety of different precisions here. Again, this is for remote navigation, a random navigation, rather. You could have everything from an A1 saying that you have your navigational uh, performance of a 10 nautical mile radius, all the way to something really, really extreme, like you're going to have a RNAV approach. You can have S1 or a T1. Uh, for example, if I put an S2 here, that would simply say that I have incredibly, incredibly, incredibly precise systems. If you're looking for the codes for those, uh, you can go pop onto it and like I'll grab this I'll link to you real quick there's this wonderful little guide called um, this one international flight plan and it breaks down what all of these different codes mean for that particular one I usually tell people if you're having to come in here and putting all this stuff in you're probably providing more detail in VATS than you really need but it is worthwhile to notice that that's what all those little letter means it's just basically going to be a required performance in this case we're 172 I'm not going to bother with that one next one's going to be your nav section your nav section is basically a way to describe the navigational capability these of your aircraft. Remember, we had an equipment code of SG. We know what our particular um, navigational technique is. But if you had to, you could actually come in here and you could dial in particular categories for it. For example, if uh, we had uh, DME, VOR, and we could produce something like OD. And that would simply mean that we have those two little different pieces there. The next one's going to be the DAT category. Uh, the DAT is basically a data. This is where you can basically expand upon all the different types of pieces here. Usually what I do in here is uh, you can put stuff as far as, you know, do I have a particular something that's out of line? Do I have something that's not going to work on a particular piece or anything along those lines? Like I said, you can be careful. 
SIR simply means surveillance. Uh, this is going to be things like your transponder capabilities. Uh, your transponders, for example, if you know, have a mode S or something like that, or mode C, I could just put a C here, but keep in mind, your equipment was already listed when you had your transponder code up here, so this one's a little bit redundant, uh, depending on, of course, in the real world, your ADSB capabilities and stuff like that. Reg is exactly what you think, so this is going to be our registration. Uh, you can have a lot of fun right here as far as to find that one. Cell, now this is interesting. If you are working with the virtual airliners, your cell is going to be your select call code. If you do not know what that is, then it's probably something that you probably shouldn't be entering. This is just a special way to communicate with you in long distances. The next one, a code here, is referring to your mode S code. Now, the interesting thing is um, I've never actually had to dial this in, in any flight plan, even the real world, so it's probably not something you're going to have to do too often. RVR is exactly what you'd expect it to be. That's going to basically be referring to uh, what you're going to have as far as uh, available our runway uh, visual. Over here, OPR is going to be a little bit different. OPR is simply a reference to what your operator is. Uh, the next one over here is PER. PER is going to be referring to the different performance of your particular aircraft. And again, this would be performance category. It's uh, something, like I said, if you're domestic or something like that, you don't have to worry about it too, too much. Otherwise, you'd have to put in a specific performance for that particular aircraft here. There's a big scary glossary that you can look up to actually identify it directly that can help you out with that. What you have here, this is your RALT. This is going to be alternate airport altitude. Now, I always think of this one pretty straightforward. Now, again, this is totally if you needed to do it necessary. If we knew, for example, we needed to fly at 8,000 feet to get there, we could put in our 8,000 feet right there if we needed to. T alt is uh, simply going to be uh, your difference. That's going to be take off alternate uh, should be required. Again, you can put that information here. ORGN is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, this one's going to be referring to uh, who, where did the flight plan come from? This is the origination. Uh, com, this is going to be what you have as far as radios on board goes. Now, keep in mind, we've already defined what type of radios we have up here with our equipment codes. So coming in here and uh, dialing in an extra detail as far as that goes, it's probably going to be a little extra redundant unless there's something special about your communications. And that brings us to EET. EET is a weird one. This is elapsed time at points. Now, when you're doing things like transoceanic flights, uh, this is going to be something that's going to make a lot of difference for you. Basically, the way that this one works is pretty straightforward. You're going to be typing in what you're crossing, and you're going to be typing in when you cross it. So, for example, if for some reason uh, we were crossing over, I don't know why we went to Atlanta, we do uh, KATL, I'm sorry, which is going to be the particular point that we're going to be crossing, and we could define when. Uh, so let's say, what would we say? Our takeoff time was uh, 1434. So we could do something, let's say I'm crossing out of the Y, 1620. You could say my estimated point over Atlanta, this particular location, is going to be at 1620. Now, if I want to put in a new one, let's say for some reason we get really lost, in La, let's go down to, um, I don't know, Orlando, and let's say we get there by 1800. So this is just a way to describe the different times you're going to be crossing specific points. Now, there's actually a lot of different points you could have here, but this is just kind of a nice, useful tool to kind of say, hey, we expect to be here at that time. Which brings us to our final piece, and of course, uh, this is our remarks. Now, uh, this is when I do the logical things to help people out. I type in things like YouTube streaming. I can say, uh, first flight, first flight ever. You could uh, do some uh, terrible pilot. Uh, you know, anything you want to do down here for remarks, this is a great tool to help folks out as far as identifying what kind of needs you're going to have when you get to that particular location. So when that's all said and done and everything's been detailed and entered, you come down here and you press the file flight plan button. So hopefully you found this video to be helpful as far as describing these different components. Like I said, you can always look up the equipment codes. If you're not sure, just do SG. If you're not sure, just put L. Just be very, very mindful of aircraft type. Be very, very mindful of your route. That is something that you can even do in the flight sim of your choice. But other than that, enjoy.